Okay, well, how about we go ahead? We'll open with the word of prayer. I've changed the collect on us today since we're now in the season of Advent. Um, there, there is an overlap between the end of the church year where we were and the season of Advent because they both concern basically what our Bible class is about, uh, the, the coming of Jesus. Advent is not just pre-Christmas. That's how we think about it sometimes, but Advent is all about all of the ways. There's really one way, but I guess you could say it's the threefold way that Jesus comes to us. That he is born of Mary in Bethlehem at Christmas, uh, that he comes to us by word and sacrament, and that we're anticipating his coming again uh, to judge the living and the dead. So there is some, it kind of bleeds from the end of the church year, which is about Jesus coming in judgment, end of the new church year when we're in the season of Advent. So this is a good collect for our purposes. Let us pray. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, before we look at the topic at hand, is there anything from the sermon that you wanted to ask about, comment about. We had our first of our two Palm Sundays. You always have the triumphal entry on the first Sunday in Advent. It's kind of cool. I think you've mentioned that before. What is it, on his head? Okay, on all donkeys. Very interesting. Do, do you routinely ride in a donkey cart, or was that just... Oh. oh, okay. Well, cool. Well, I will say we uh, took the kids to the, the Living Nativity on Banner Day, the Franken Trophy. They get a really big kick out of that. And they had, uh, they had a camel, they had donkeys. I didn't check the donkey. So next time I'll have to do that. But when you get like, has it, who, who has been to Living Nativity? Carol has. Frankentrost. It's down, it's, yeah, it's right there in that area. That'd be a very good trip, yeah. I'd like to take the youths. I think they would enjoy that. Yeah, so I, I didn't check the donkey, but uh, anyway, um, he might have kicked me, I don't know. So, all right, anybody else, anything about the sermon? Oh, I should have pointed out to you, I always put the, the liturgical day at the top of your sheet. Today is actually St. Nicholas's Day. So, European children... And maybe you've heard of this. Uh, the night before, December the 5th, is St. Nicholas's Eve. So they go to bed, and their moms and dads say, stay in bed, because St. Nicholas can't see you out of bed. And in the morning, they usually have little treats and things in their shoes. The, the traditional gifts are oranges, and like, you know, those little gold chocolate coins you can get in the store this time of year? Uh, St. Nicholas's Day. So there you go. Somehow in this country, they moved his visit from December the 6th to the 24th. And that's actually probably because of a poem that we all know, the immortal words, "'Twas the night before Christmas." So then he stopped coming on his feast day and he started coming on Christmas Eve. But, uh, so that is today. All right, anyway, you wanna talk about Israel? Yes, okay. How about we do that? You will need a Bible at some point today. What we're going to do first is some very big overview kind of things. Everybody has a sheet? Okay. All right, so uh, when we started this now no longer brief Bible study on the end times, I made the comment that this is timely for us. And I did not plan this one, but you might recall when we started back in October, this was when across the pond... Uh, our friends and neighbors in Israel and Palestine started going at it again. Not that that ever really stops, but it just kind of flares up from time to time. 
And I think you have probably heard something that I've heard plenty, which is when things start to happen in the Middle East, people start saying things like, this is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy or something like that. So it is a good question um, to, to think of it very broadly. Uh, what role does national ethnic Israel and the ethnic Jewish people have to do with what uh, the Bible actually teaches about the end times. You probably know, or you have some idea, that our friends that we always talk about, one day I'll give you the technical term, but let's just say our rapture friends, they're very interested in all the intrigue that goes on in the Middle East. There's a lot of reasons for that. And uh, they, they have their view on it um, in terms of uh, what role national or ethnic Israel plays in the end times. So the question is, is any of that true? And I guess it depends what they say. Uh, I do want to be fair and say, if you're thinking about Christians as a broader group, not just dispensationalists, those are people who believe in the secret rapture and things, not just that group, but, but Christians as a whole, Throughout the history of the church, there have definitely been Christians, not of the crazy variety, who've anticipated like a mass conversion of the Jews at the end of time. And they have various reasons for why they believe that. Lutherans do not believe that categorically. We are not anticipating a mass conversion of Jewish people. Um, it all kind of hinges, not to prejudice you from the beginning, but it all kind of hinges on how we understand some of the things that St. Paul says. And uh, you don't have to read every word of our introduction here, but basically, and we won't look at it today, but St. Paul makes the claim in Romans chapter 11 that all Israel will be saved. And it's very important to look at, at the overarching context of what St. Paul is talking about. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that uh, Israel sometimes figures in our reflection in these discussions about the last things, about Jesus' second coming and uh, the end times. Do you have anything you want to say or ask about that before we keep going? This is one of those things, maybe you don't believe this about me. I really try not to politic. I really don't like to do that. Um, there, there are some things that we have to talk about in the life of the church because they're profoundly moral and theological issues. Obviously, the hot-button issues are things of that nature. Um, I really don't care how you vote. I don't think you care how I vote. I don't think any of my political views are particularly original. Uh, but Christian people have no business at any level supporting or advocating things like abortion, homosexuality, and so on and so forth. That's just a given. Okay, that's not, not controversial in this room, I would think. Uh, this issue has become politicized uh, in a way that um, I want to try to put aside. So the whole thing about the modern nation state of Israel and Palestine does not have to factor into what we believe, it's not supposed to, um, about uh, the Jewish people as a people group or about what and who Israel actually is. There are various opinions on what needs to be done uh, in that land, okay? Um, I don't think everybody is as holy and righteous as their advocates claim that they are. What I find, I think that Americans get so riled up about this because uh, they just like picking sides on things, just to be very uncharitable. I don't think people really have this like wounded sense of justice either for Israelis or Palestinians. I think they just put their nose in things that really don't concern them. So you may hold whatever good faith view you want to on what is the solution. Is it a two-state solution? On and on and on. I think the thing we could all agree on is you should not be killing innocent people. I would hope. Uh, I, I would hope most people know that Hamas is not representative of all the Palestinian people. And uh, of the two, between Israel and Palestine, where is the majority of Christians in that region? 
Palestine. Um, and they have been there since our Lord Jesus preached in Palestine. Uh, the, the people, just personally, and then we won't discuss this any further unless you want to, the people I feel the most for are the Palestinian Christians. That they are the most forgotten, marginalized people in the whole thing. The reason is, is that they're living in a region that is dominated by Muslims, and they are Arabs, but the Muslims don't care. They don't accept them as true Arabs because they're not Muslims. On the other hand, um, the land in which they live is being occupied by the Israeli government. And what happens with what is cynically called war collateral is uh, you drop a bomb, as happened, blew up you know, the oldest Orthodox church in Gaza, which was a hospital, killed all these people, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and then it's dismissed as, it's what happens in war. What are you going to do? But they were storing stuff in the hospital. I mean, you think they want to keep that? Yeah, you would, you know. But see, and it's like, well, what can one do? Because all these people live on top of each other. And uh, if you've ever looked at a map, you know it's not like this. You know, it's not like, well, Israel here, Palestine here, but the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are like within the greater national boundaries of the state of Israel. I had a conversation with a pastor, actually, a pastor, um, I used to be Carol's mom's pastor, uh, Pastor Azam, uh, who just retired in the last I don't, year, year and a half, I think. He's ethnically Palestinian. His parents came from Palestine to Detroit many, many, many years ago when some of this unpleasantness was getting started, like with the Arab-Israeli wars and all of these things. And so I saw him at this conference I went to. I said, Tim, um, I want to talk to you about this whole thing and just get your perspective on it. And he said something that I think all of us should bear in mind. This is a man who's from his family. His family lives in Nazareth. Okay, that was his family's homeland. He still got third cousins in Nazareth. And he looked at me and he said, I do not know enough about it to really comment on it. And I said, can you go and say that louder for everybody in the United States, including people in the media and in the upper echelons of power? Uh, so let's put that aside. It doesn't matter what you, what you believe about that. Um, whatever your political view is, you can hold in good faith and that can be fine. Uh, and then you can kind of ask yourself the question, why does it matter if you and I <laughs> have a view on Israel and Palestine? Uh, I have to say that because it kind of muddies the waters of this discussion. Because when you say Israel, what is Israel? Um, right, and so it's like, and by the way, just so you know, uh, Palestine is a very old designation for that region. And it comes from the time... I'm pretty sure when Alexander the Great conquered, you know, between the Old and the New Testaments. So that region, it was never a country, but that region has been called Palestine. Palestine is from the word Philistine, because historically, you know, the Philistine people in the land of Canaan. It doesn't prove anything about who belongs, what belongs to who, okay? Doesn't, doesn't prove anything, right? The American Indians can tell you that. Doesn't matter how long people live anywhere. That's not really how the spoils of war works. Anyway, I've said too much. Do you want to say anything about that? You probably hear enough about it. All right, but that does lead to the question, and now we're at the top of page two, because everything is in a definition, so we need to talk about some definitions. <coughs> is it a fair question, then, when you read the Bible, because Israel is all over the Bible, what is Israel? And really, the, the first question you should ask is, who is Israel? Because before Israel is a land or a kingdom or a people, there's one guy. And that would be who? Who was given the name Israel? Yeah. yeah. Our friend Jacob, uh, who, uh, remember, because he, he wrestled with God. He strove. He strove or he strived? He has striven with God. Uh, that's what Israel meant, to wrestle with God. He wrestles with God. And so the, the blessing that God gives to Jacob when they wrestle near the fords of the river Jabbok is he gives him that name, Israel. And from Jake, so Jacob is the son of who, by the way? Isaac. 
Isaac is the son of Abraham. Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the line, you know, continues on. So that's who Israel is first. Now, you know where they're going, the, the land that God promised to Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, was the land of Canaan, the land of the Philistines, eventually. Uh, and so you could say, well, that, that land that was allotted to the people, to Jacob's children, to the Israelites, they call that Israel. Right? They have all of those allotments. Moses is leading the people out of Egypt back to their land, to the promised land. And then uh, Joshua takes over, and those conquests of the land happen in Joshua's time. Uh, yes, John. Didn't God tell them they were supposed to kill all the people? I don't know what how might be. All the ites, yes. But they were Canaanites, Perizzites, Hittites. Yeah. So you could say it's their fault to begin with. It is their fault to begin with, yes. The, the best thing to do is always find how many different kinds of people can you blame. Yeah, yeah they made that, and you know, now which was it, the Gershonites? I can't remember. They, they, they tricked them. And so they're like, oh, no, we've not lived here. You know, we're, we're new, you know, in town. So without consulting God, Joshua and Israel make a covenant with them. And God's like, what did you do that for? These are the people you're supposed to kick out. It makes that point in the book of Joshua. And uh, so they, they don't ever entirely do the thing that God says. Uh, that causes problems for them later. And the other thing that we won't look so much at today, but it is also true, and you need to tell your friends this, uh, all of those promises about land are conditional in the Bible. This, this notion, and this we can say, so remember, you can hold whatever view you want about Israel and Palestine, um, but it is not a scriptural view, it is not biblical, that that land belongs to the Jewish people by divine right, and it, it's always theirs, and there is no condition attached to that. That is not true, okay? That's a theological view, that's not a political view. That does not mean they shouldn't live there. It just means if they have it, it is not because because God said in the Bible. You cannot say that. There's a lot that's happened between the giving of the land of Canaan to Joshua and the people and Jesus Christ <laughs> and where we are today. Um, but And this does bring out something else, too. shouldn't mention it, but I will. Uh, the conquest of the land of Canaan is also not an excuse for some of the things done to Palestinians. Because I've heard people say that. They're like, well, look, man, the land belongs to the, the people from God. So that means you can kill them all if you want. <laughs> uh, there are actually people who think this. Um, these people are stupid, okay? That, that's a really knuckleheaded and a wicked thing to say. Uh, so those things need to be put out of mind. It's also a really poor excuse. And it's not that I don't kind of believe it. But uh, anytime this stuff happens in the Middle East, people look at it and they say, well, what do you expect? Those people have been fighting about that. And there is a religious and ethnic angle to it. They've been fighting about that for thousands of years. They're not going to stop now. That, that might be true, but that's not really, that's not a good excuse for this stuff that keeps going on and on and on. Particularly when you remember that some of that was kind of the fault of the Western world. Because who partitioned that land? First it was the British Empire, and then the United Nations. So, could it be that uh, America is a little culpable in some of the problems that we have in the Middle East? Now I've said way too much. But let's go back to the Bible. That's right. It's like, haven't you screwed up things enough here in our 50 states without screwing it up for other people? Um, because, again, remember, you and I really don't, and I include myself in this case, we don't really understand that stuff. We, we, don't, we don't get it. Nobody in here is an Arab or a Jew. You and I don't get it. And it's really kind of, um, it's arrogant for us, not us, not you and me. It's arrogant for us to keep putting our fingers into something we don't get. It never turns out very well, to be honest. As I said, I've said too much. Please write to the district president and say that I've uh, politic too much. Anyway, so it's, uh, it's Jacob. It's the land of Canaan. 
And then you know what eventually happens is they establish a kingdom. The point here is that what Israel means in the Bible depends on the context. Okay? Because the Bible is not really an encyclopedia. Remember, we talked uh, about uh, how the Bible is not a textbook. It's not like you find, the, you find the word in bold and it's like, all right, so that's, that's what chlorophyll is. So every time I see the word in my textbook, it means the same thing. It's not like that in the Bible. So it depends on the context. Are you talking about the land? Are you talking about Jacob? Are you talking about the, the monarchy? It's just something important to, to keep in mind. Uh, so remembering from our Old Testament study, we're all Old Testament scholars now. Uh, there was a united kingdom for a little bit. First king was Saul. Didn't exactly work out. His successor was everybody's favorite, David. And then they liked his son pretty well, Solomon. Solomon was the one. Remember when he departed from the right worship of God? God said, I am going, I am going to rip the kingdom from you. So then his son Rehoboam takes over. Rehoboam is an idiot. And uh, it's because of Rehoboam that the kingdom is divided. So then Israel is no longer the undivided kingdom, but now it's the northern kingdom. And then the southern kingdom becomes Judah, right? It's the same land. You see, it's all the land of Israel. But now we've got two distinct political entities. So in what sense? Is the north Israel, south Israel, is the whole thing Israel? You see the kind of, you know, it's a fair question. The, uh, and stop me any time. The one that I want to drive home for you, and really the actual reason that Israel matters for the end times, is that the, the full teaching of the Bible that comes to us when we have the New Testament is that Israel is the church. The, by which I mean the true Israel. Not ethnic Israel, not outward Israel, but the people who actually strive with God, lay hold of Him by faith in Jesus Christ. This is the, the true people of God, because there's only one. That's the Holy Christian Church. Now that church is comprised of people who ethnically speaking, Jews, some of them, not so many anymore. Uh, today, mostly Gentiles. But there, you know, there are some Jews who believe in Jesus as their Savior. And it also includes people who uh, they came before the coming of Christ in the flesh. And Abraham is the one that we'll see in particular. Uh, they, they trust in the Messiah who is to come. People have always been saved by faith. Some of them are saved by faith in the Messiah who's coming. We are saved by faith in the Messiah who has come. But we really are one Israel. It's one church. It's one people of God. When you know that, then you kind of understand why it is. You can read the news and you can, as the young people call it, you can doom scroll when you get up. I don't have a newspaper anymore. So get up, look at the phone, doom, doom. Just look at all the doom. Just keep scrolling. Look at all the good news. Uh, and you can see all that stuff about the modern nation state of Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia, and you can say, oh, well, that's really unfortunate. We can pray about that, and I'm going to keep on because I'm an Israelite. I'm a member of the church. Uh, do you have any questions about that? So, Christians like us, especially in the Jesus we are part of Israel? We are the true and spiritual Israel of God. And, and that's, see, and this, this is what God was always intending to do. See, God starts on a very small scale when you think about it. How many, how many people were in the church in the beginning? Let's go back way, way, way back. First, we just had one, right? God instructed Adam, you shall not eat of the tree. Make sure you teach your wife the same thing. Then he makes Eve. So then we got two, right? We got two in the church. And then 
you know, that promise that we traced all through the Old Testament goes through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and of course, you know, they're doing fun things and reproducing along the way, but it really is still by faith that you're included in that people. So as that lineage continues, so then we go from Adam and Eve to this family, to these 12 tribes, to this kingdom, and now here we are that the gospel has been dispersed beyond these ethnic, you know, borders and distinctions to everybody in this room, you know, to the Gentiles. So that, uh, and this is always the thrust of the Old Testament, that God is calling a people for himself, but he's doing that from all nations, that he's gathering into one people. And that's really not something that becomes clear even to God's people until after Jesus has ascended. Because then uh, Peter and the other apostles have to deal with, I mean, God did tell us to do this stuff. He did tell us to circumcise. He did tell us to keep these dietary laws. So now what do we do? And how do we include people who, like, they have no background to that. They don't know anything about the God of Israel. They don't have the scriptures. Um, now it's just be baptized, you know, and you're in the club. Um, so, but that's what he was always intending to do. It's not so much a matter of, like, God had a people. They kind of teed him off. So he's like, oh, forget about you. And then we'll, we'll go to the Gentiles. That's how that's kind of portrayed sometimes. That's not our view. That's not our belief. Um, but yeah, so, and I, I'm gonna, we're going to look at the Bible passages too to, to see that. Um, but you and I are Israel, according to what the Bible teaches. And then the one other is uh, the modern nation state of Israel, which is not in the Bible. It's a really confusing thing. It's a confusing thing because... Uh, Gee, I mean, the modern nation state of Egypt is not ruled by the Pharaoh, as far as I know, right? Egypt today is not Egypt of 4,000 years ago. You would hope that people would understand this too about Israel. Many people do not. And that's why we have to, I suppose, burst their bubble. Um, but uh, so it's just an important distinction to make in your mind. When you, when you look at the context of the Bible, what Israel are you talking about? What we'll see is sometimes, especially Paul, he'll vacillate between them. So Paul makes this statement. He says, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Okay, so not all who are descended, that would be ethnically, that's what, what we call Jewish people. Not everybody who's descended from Israel belongs to the true Israel, right? They're not the people of God if they don't believe in Jesus. That's kind of the bottom line on that one. So, but like we said, those are not really technical terms. It's just how people talk. And that's how it comes to us in the Bible. So you can understand why there's some confusion about things like that. Because we've always think of Jews as non believed in Jesus. That's the dividing line other than culturally. You yeah. Know? So mm -hmm. that's. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to think of it in like in religious terms, like Judaism as a religion is defined by its rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, which that that's a whole nother. You want to you want to touch this one right now? Um, <laughs> you want to blow somebody's mind? Uh, all right, which one? You know, how chicken and the egg. Uh, which one came first, Judaism or Christianity? I heard Christianity over here, or Judaism over here. I, I guess I would have said Judaism. But. Yeah. I guess it kind of depends like what the words mean, don't you think? Right, yeah, uh, the context. But, <laughs> but if you think about, let's look at Judaism as we know it today. Uh, a lot of people are unaware of this. And I'll put my cards on the table, I guess. You'll, you'll, you'll get some things about me, I suppose. Um, Judaism as a religion today, and this is just a matter of historical record, their traditions, their customs, and the way that they interpret their Bible, which would just be the Old Testament, develops after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Remember we talked about the destruction of the temple. Uh, 
the destruction of the temple was a huge crisis for Jews because the temple was everything. It was the center of their worship and religious life. They had the sacrifices. Um, they, they were required by God's law to make these pilgrimages, you know, for the feasts and everything. When the temple is destroyed, which happens in accordance with God's will, you know, he's like, no more, okay? No more sacrifices because my son has been sacrificed. You, you don't have to worship in this building anymore because the temple is first the body of Jesus and it's also the Holy Christian Church. I'm done with it. I don't want it anymore. You broke the rules anyway. No more temple. Well, so what happens is the, the Jewish leaders, who we call the Pharisees, they go, okay, how can one be a Jew without the temple? And that should have been the sign to them that it's like, maybe it's time to repent and believe in the gospel and the Messiah that God sent. Well, they don't do that. So the, the focus in their belief system is no longer temple and sacrifice, but it becomes what happens in the synagogue and what they teach. And that's the rise of what we call rabbinical Judaism. And all of the traditions and everything else that accumulate is eventually written down in a book called the Talmud. And the Talmud is the lens through which Jewish people read the Old Testament. And it's the Talmud that tries to teach them that the Old Testament is not about Jesus. It has all the Jewish traditions and things like that. That is the foundation for the religion that we call today Judaism. So you see, that is not the faith of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets or the patriarchs. It's not the faith of the saints in the Old Testament because they didn't have any of that stuff. They didn't they didn't reject Jesus. Uh, they believed that the Messiah was coming, and they were justified by faith in the Messiah who's going to come. But all of that other stuff that people look at and they get impressed by, <laughs> I don't want to be mean, but they're like, ooh, so this, there's like, they look at Jewish traditions and they want to see, so what's the import for us? And it's like, there is no import for us because it's got nothing to do with the Bible or being a Christian, okay? So the truth is, when, when Jesus came into their midst and they rejected him as their Messiah, they, in their unbelief and their hard-heartedness, they persisted in, how can I be a Jew without Jesus, without the temple? And that's what Judaism is. So Judaism is a reaction to Christianity. Judaism, as it exists today, comes out of Christianity as opposed to the other way around. Because it's, really, it's not really true or honest to say that Judaism, you know, is the religion of Abraham, because it's not. And Jesus tells the Jews that, too. He tells the Jews, he said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And if you were the children of Abraham, you would have believed in me instead of trying to murder me. So at the time, they were repressed. They're in a kind of awkward spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And because that, that's what Peter preaches on Pentecost. You know, in Acts chapter 2, he says, uh, guys, you, and he says you, in a broad sense, you know, he said, you crucified the Lord of glory. Oops. You killed the author of life, is what he says. Uh, yeah, so you could understand at one level, if that's your whole world, and then you have somebody who comes and tells you, and you and your authorities were complicit in killing the guy that your Bible is all about. Do you understand why there's that divide <laughs> between Jews and Christians? Um, and it, it ought to be there. If we don't believe in the same Jesus, then we're not part of the same people of God. Yeah, John. I guess what Bill would do Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it all turned out pretty well, I would say. Jesus dying was to forgive our sins. He needed to be sacrificed. Good job, guys. Yeah, well, yeah, 
Paul makes this point too. He says if their if their rejection of Jesus has meant the reconciliation of the world, what would their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? If then they trusted in the Messiah that they put to death. Yeah. So because we aren't we are thankful that Jesus died, right? You know, Good Friday is not a funeral for Jesus. It's kind of a somber thing, but um, there there are, there are peoples and you know, individuals to impugn historical guilt. That's certainly true. But that's not the greater point of Jesus' death, right? And this is where, when the term gets thrown around, you know, we don't, um, anti-Semitism, we don't attribute the death of Jesus to every Jewish person who's ever lived. All right, that's kind of dumb. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, in an, in an historical sense, who put him to death? Well, in the Creed we say Pontius Pilate, and when Jesus is on trial, when, when he and Pilate have a little one-on-one -on -one in John 18, uh, Jesus simply says, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above, but don't worry because he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And Jesus never explains, and who would that be? <laughs> is that Herod? Because remember, they kind of, they send him back and forth. Is it Judas? Is it the priests? Who are you talking about? And, you know, Jesus doesn't say, he's like, don't feel too bad because you're not as guilty. Even though Pilate's the one who, it's his soldiers who put the nails in the hands, you know. Um, there, there's only, it's only so helpful to, like, try to iron out. So who's responsible? It's like, well, I don't know. Are you a sinner? I think that makes you responsible for Jesus' death. You are the occasion for which he has come. I, I told Shannon the other day, I remember I heard a sermon one time, around this time of year, in which the preacher said, uh, you know, people say, Jesus is the reason for the season. It's like, I don't really agree with that. You are the reason for the season, right? You are the reason that Jesus came down from heaven and died. So, you know, pat yourself on the back. You're the reason for the Christmas season. That might preach. I don't know. But, uh, yes. Okay. Let me stop for a minute. Does anybody else have any... Questions, comments, concerns, because you can have concerns if you want to. So they're still looking for the Messiah, right? That kind of depends on the Jew that you ask. And, and this actually, this is a very good, if you've ever had any interactions with Jewish people. Um, where I grew up, I knew, I knew a few. Um, not like my dad, you know, my dad grew up in New York, which when you grew up on Long Island, New York, uh, when you go to confession, you say, you know my lawyer, God. Bad joke. Bad joke. Um, his, his father lived a little time in Massapequa, New York, which because of the population of Jews and Roman Catholics was called matzo pizza. Uh, but um, anyway, you laugh at different ethnic jokes. That's fine. Um, yeah, oh yeah, so Jews and the Messiah. So because they have this whole tradition built up, uh, a lot of Christian people are, are disappointed or confused when they, when they actually meet a Jewish person. They're like, oh, well, I'm a Christian, you know. I know who your Bible's about. See, they don't even, they're not even reading the Bible in the same way. So there are groups that, that believe that there is a, an individual, like there's a personal Messiah who's going to come. He's going to be the king of Israel and he's kick out the Palestinians or something. I don't know. That's a very small group. That's like the very orthodox, very traditional Jews. Most Jews are not like that. Most Jews today are very liberal. Um, and in America, the three major denominations are the orthodox. And then there are uh, the conservatives, which are really kind of moderately liberal. And then the reformed Jews are just very liberal. You know, they've got women rabbis and everything. They're like, they're like the Congregationalist Church or the Episcopal Church of the Jewish world, okay? So most of them, they're, they're not even, they don't believe Moses is a literal person, much less are they looking for a literal Messiah to come and save them. Um, they tend to look at themselves, you know, as, as a people group and say, well, you can see how Jewish people have been so persecuted throughout history, and um, in a way, some of them believe that their persecution is supposed to help lead to a greater justice in the world. So they have this kind of like messianic view. 
of themselves, which is about the most pathetic thing I think you could believe, to be honest with you. Um, so it's very, it's very hard to have these conversations with Jewish people because like, they don't believe the faith of the Old Testament. So it's not like they're like, well, you know, the prophet said that the, the seed of the woman's going to be born and he's going to take away her sins. Well, they don't really, they don't read the Old Testament that way. So it's so, self-justification? Yeah, I mean, Judaism, and that's, that's a good way to put it. Judaism is a basically legalistic religion. Um, and I don't mean that like in a pejorative way, but like if you even listen to, and I don't, his voice really bothers me, but if you ever listen to Ben Shapiro, he's, a, he's an Orthodox Jew, he's a conservative commentator. Uh, ben Shapiro, who's on the traditional end of Judaism, he makes very clear that, that Judaism is not like a faith-based religion. Uh, it doesn't matter to Ben Shapiro, who again is on the conservative traditional end of Judaism. It doesn't matter to him whether God literally parted the Red Sea. It doesn't matter to him whether Adam and Eve really existed. He said, to be a Jew is about keeping the law. Like, the way that they understand that their relationship with God is they hold on to their traditions and their customs. And they look at religion more in, in a terms of like a culture and a way of life. They do believe in God, but that's what it means to them. So they're not reading the Old Testament looking for, well, you know, what was it? Yeah, because it's like, I don't even know if Moses lived. I mean, that, that's not the point of the Bible to them. So there's a lot of really big obstacles when it comes to things of that nature, because then you realize we actually share very, very little in common. And I, I'm not trying to overstate that. I'm just saying they have the Old Testament, and that's a good thing but they've been given a lens for the last basically 2,000 years that, that tries to steer them away from the actual conclusion of the thing, which is the coming of Jesus. So, yes, Linda. So what we heard from each other, why is that after all that was laid? Like what about the Jesus of peace? Then, then Jesus. Then um, the they, they, they suffer the same fate that anybody um, and, this, and this brings up something Mary had asked about, too. Actually, I'm going to answer that. Let's keep going. Uh, that's a good segue. I did want to mention okay, one Okay, go ahead. Thing. Go ahead. I mentioned this before, and I watched this before, and it's really quite an interesting show, and it's called The Jewish Jesus. It's on at 9 o'clock in the morning, and he's a, a rabbi, but he preaches Jesus, and I really find him interesting, and I haven't found any real conflicting ideas coming from him yet he hasn't when i watched him now it's been a few weeks because i don't it's a hit or miss thing you know that i get to to watch him consistently but he hasn't that i know of mentioned too much about you know israel and palestine and all of what's going on there he focuses on the bible the resurrection jesus and a few like traditional Jewish things he will mention, you know, because he is Jewish. So anyway, I don't know what channel it's on, if anybody ever does want to watch it, but I do find it interesting because of the all the Jewish ideas and what we know about Jews. At least I feel like there is some Jews that have the um, hope. Yeah, they do, and the messianic, messianic Judaism is uh, Jews who believe in Jesus, and one of the things that they do is they want to hold on to some of their, you know, traditions and customs and things, because they, it, and you can understand, I mean, it's a part of their culture, you know, and there is like, it's biblical in one sense, right, I mean, keeping the Passover, doing things like that, uh, so they're, they're definitely, I've been to a messianic Jewish synagogue one time, and it was a it was an interesting experience. But uh, yeah, those people are definitely out there. They they're a little odd though because sometimes you're like, all right, so you're a Christian, and they're like, no, Gentiles are Christians, and it's like, you believe in Jesus? Yes. So you're a Christian? No, I'm a Jew. And it's like, 
So then you're like, what is a Jew? Can you tell me that? That's like the million dollar question. So what is a Jew? Um, the, the term Jew is one that you see later on in the Old Testament. And you notice we're distinguishing it from Israel because not every Jew is a true Israelite, as we talked about. Um, but uh, the, the word Jew is derived from Judah because by the time that Nebuchadnezzar comes and he takes the people from the southern kingdom of Judah into exile, remember there's no more kingdom of Israel anymore. The northern kingdom taken away by the Assyrians never to return to this day. So the only Israelites, so to speak, are the Judahites. That's where the word Jew comes from, the Jews as a people. Uh, and eventually that, that region comes to be known not just as Judah, because that's the name of the kingdom proper, but it becomes Judea. It becomes a Babylonian province. So that province becomes Judea, the Judeans. And uh, the, the military governor of Judea during Jesus' ministry is a man named Pontius Pilate. Right? So that's where the, the Jews come from. Uh, one other use of the term Jew, because Jew, like Israel, is not a technical term. Uh, especially in the Gospel of John, you'll see the phrase, oops, did I lose it? You see the phrase, the Jews. You remember when uh, the Passion of the Christ came out? It's been about 20 years now, hard to believe. Yeah, 2004. Yeah, so because it came out, I believe, Ash Wednesday, 2004. Uh, Mel Gibson, who I'm not convinced is the sanest man to ever walk the face of the earth. He has said some things that were regrettable, but I thought it was very unfair. One of the criticisms of the Passion of the Christ was that it was anti-Semitic because they had a problem with how he portrayed the Jews, right? And it's like, well, gee, read the Gospel of John. I'm sorry. Uh, the, the term, though, in, in John specifically, when John refers to the Jews, he's talking about the Jewish religious authorities. So he's talking about the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. It's kind of like if you read the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel talks about the Chaldeans. Well, everybody ethnically is a Chaldean, but Chaldean is a term for, like, like the Magi and the other people in Nebuchadnezzar's court. That's just the term that he used. It's the literal term, the Jews. Yeah, the Jews. So, so, you know, Jesus says to the Jews, you are of your father, the devil. Right? He's talking to the Pharisees because he said, you seek to kill me. Did he say every Jew of all times and all places is of their father, the devil? No. Okay. So people need to leave us alone about this. But you, you know how it is. I mean, what you do is if you don't like what somebody says, just call them a racist, you know, and that will shut them up. Because um, what it does is it distracts from the issue. It's like, well, I'm sorry you don't feel like the Jewish religious establishment is favorably portrayed in the New Testament. Could it possibly be you don't want to talk about what it is that upset them so much about Jesus, which is that... He is the Son of God, and he came and he fulfilled their scriptures. And because they wanted to maintain their, their position of power, they were not going to abide that. All right. Anybody? Okay, let's keep going. We want to talk about the phrase chosen people. By show of hands... Please raise your hand if you have heard the phrase, or you've heard Israel or the Jewish people referred to as God's chosen people. Okay, most people, that's what I figured. So I'm not going to say no, they're not, but the question that you always have to ask is, in what sense do you mean that? Because Mary brought up last time, uh, there, there are folks, there are Christians, and this goes to what Linda asked. There, there are people who believe, or, or they think that, that that phrase, that designation, chosen people, 
must mean that um, they're good. And some of the, the false teachers, like John Hagee, who is still alive, and he is, I really hope he repents, because he's old and he's a false teacher. Um, John Hagee teaches from his pulpit as a allegedly Christian preacher. Um, he says that Jesus came and the Gentiles trust in Jesus by faith for salvation, but the Jews, they already have a covenant with God, so they're, they're going to be saved by keeping the law, uh, which is a terrible false doctrine. All right, that's contrary to everything that the Bible teaches about the forgiveness of sins and justification. But that's what John Hagee teaches. So sometimes that phrase has been misconstrued into something else. It's been kind of misconstrued into making it, well, Jewish people are descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the rest, so they kind of get a pass, for lack of a better term. That's a very crude way of putting it, but, but there are people in our churches who believe this. Um, if that's what you mean by chosen people, then the answer is no. Jewish people are not the chosen people of God. If you mean something else by it, then it can be a legitimate expression, and that's what I want to look at. We are doing kind of what I don't like to do, which is I'm giving you proof texts. We are eventually going to look at bigger passages because I want you to see the context of the thing. But we're on page three. Um, Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, God is uh, reiterating the law because they're finally getting to the point. They're getting to the end of that 40-year stint, you know, didn't listen to God, and so they've wandered in the wilderness. We're getting to the end of Moses' life, and uh, Moses gives the, this, um, he repeats himself, basically. That's what the book of Deuteronomy is about. He wants to make sure that the people are instructed before they go into the promised land. So he tells them, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. So the people he's speaking to, 12 tribes, God has chosen them for a purpose. Don't disagree with that. What is the purpose? What does it mean for a particular ethnic or an ethno-religious people group to be chosen by God? Um, and the the Bible gives us a fuller picture of that. St. Paul in Romans 9, Paul is making the point, uh, he says that he himself ethnically is an Israelite, he's of the tribe of Benjamin, and he, he wishes, Paul even says, I wish that I myself could be damned and accursed so that my kinsmen would believe the gospel. His heart breaks for the people of ethnic Israel. And he makes this point. They are Israelites in what sense? In, in the ethnic sense, right? In the outward sense. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. So all of these things were given to them, right? They were given to their forefathers. Their forefathers were there, not yours and mine, when Moses received the law, the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, um, they were the ones who had the sacrificial system, they had the temple, they had the tabernacle, um, they had the covenants. Remember, they're descended from Noah, right? Well, we all are, I guess, technically, you know. But God makes a covenant with Noah, he made a covenant with Abraham, he made the covenant on Mount Sinai. That, those things belong to them. They don't belong to you and me in a historical sense. And that's okay to say, it's fine. And the other thing is, verse 5 right there, to them belong the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. That's kind of cool. It's like there are people who are related to God by blood, according to the flesh, right? Because Jesus is the fulfillment of those promises. Uh, he is descended from David. He's called the son of David. Uh, when you trace the line through the Old Testament, it's Jesus' lineage. So yeah, according to the flesh, they're people related to God in human form. It's kind of cool. Something you could appreciate, you know, if you were a Jewish person. I don't quite understand that. Okay, please because continue. Because usually the, that's me, too, for me, or I pronounce that, comes from the 
father, right? And so Joseph really wasn't his father, so it's kind of like... Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Um, well, yeah, so you're right. Joseph is legally his father. Uh, but uh, Mary, though, is also um, right. descended from David. So, yeah, so lineally, like in his genealogy, he is descended from David through the one natural parent that he has. So biologically, he is. Um, he is the son of David in that sense. Um, so, and this is always something worth pointing out because it's, it's not just Joseph, even though, you know, the Christmas story, he was of the house and lineage of David. That's true of Joseph, and it's also true of Mary. Uh, because the angel Gabriel tells Mary, we'll hear this in a couple of weeks, most wonderful time of the year. The angel says, and, uh, and he will give him the throne of his father, David. So Mary is also, she might have originally been from Bethlehem herself. I guess she'd have to be. Um, so she traveled with Joseph for the census to pay the taxes. Uh, but, but see, they've got him either way. He is, in fact, biologically, he's the son of David. But also, see, the world doesn't know Joseph is not his father. But even in a legal sense, he's got it both ways. He's got it both by his genealogy, his bloodline, and legally. Legally, he's the son of David, too. Both actually and legally. But that's a good question. Thanks for asking that. So this is the sense in which, if you want to use that phrase, and, and maybe you should use it with a caveat, that's the sense in which the Jewish people are the chosen people of God. What have they been chosen for? Uh, they were the people that God chose for, to reveal himself to the world. Remember, God starts on a small scale. We start in Eden, go to Sinai, we have the land of Israel, and then eventually Jesus comes, you know, to be the savior of all people. Uh, he does that. He gives Jesus, excuse me, a lot of coffee today. He gives Jesus a bloodline. He gives him a family. He gives him a culture. He gives him a background. And so the Jewish people are that vehicle then for God's salvation to the whole world. Right? That's the only reason for which God has selected them. And God even tells them that in Deuteronomy. He says, I chose you because I love you. Um, it's not because you're a big people, an impressive people, but I chose you out of all the nations of the world, out of my grace. And that's, they're supposed to, so they get, they get chosen, not for their own benefit, but for the benefit of all the world. I mean, they're chosen so you and I, you know, can be part of the Israel of God. All right, any questions about that? I did give you this other one from Romans 3. St. Paul says then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? And you want to resist and say, he's got no advantage, we're all the same. Well, not exactly, right? Because he says, much in every way. It is advantageous to be a Jew. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Right? I mean, they had the scriptures, they had the prophets. The, the only reason any of it makes any sense when Jesus comes is because Jesus is the fulfillment of the scriptures and the prophets. That ought to be an advantage. Maybe we should put it that way. It doesn't make Jews better than Gentiles. Uh, but you would hope that you're like, okay, well then you know what to expect when the Messiah comes. It's a great tragedy of history that uh, the majority of people who should have been expecting Jesus reject him or don't recognize him when he comes. But yeah, they do have those advantages. So that's the sense in which they're chosen. Are you hearing anything that you have not heard before? That's what I kind of, I kind of figured. Um, and that's a good thing. It's good. We're learning. Um, I did give you this one from 1 Peter, and the reason I did is to show you that this is really to underscore the point that the true, the true Israel are those who trust in Jesus, the, the church. Because the the phrases that I underlined for you are the ones that are basically taken from Deuteronomy 7. So look how St. Peter describes the church. He's writing to the church. He says, you are a chosen, there's the word, 
You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And see, you have the purpose, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people. At one point, we were not part of the people of God. But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's what it means to be a true Israelite. And that's only something, though, that becomes clear after Jesus comes, because it is Jesus coming. It's his revelation that clarifies all of these things for us. And it takes some work to get there, you know, as you read the Bible. All right. You want to do like John? You want to stretch? Refill your drinks? Because we got a little bit of time. All right, I don't have any commercials for you other than church tonight. <laughs> yeah, let's skip the commercial break. Uh, church at 6.30, dinner at 5.30. All right, in that case, if you got a Bible, we're going to look at Galatians. So you can see that I'm not making it up. All right. Galatians. We're going to try, ostensibly, look at three and four. Give you some lightning fast context. By the way, you can always, please do take these home. You can, you can fact check. You can go more at your own pace. And also you can listen to our um, audio recordings if that helps you. All right, Galatians. Galatians is a letter of the great apostle Paul. Paul writes to the church in Galatia because they're having a problem. The problem is, is that there is a group of false teachers that we call the Judaizers. They're called Judaizers because they are advocating basically a return to Judaism, I guess you could say. They're, they're saying there are certain aspects of the Old Testament law that you have to keep to be saved. You ha if you're a man, you have to be circumcised. Um, and it seems they're implying other things. You need to keep the Sabbath. You need to keep the dietary laws. And this is, as we talked about, this is just good old-fashioned legalism. This works righteousness. Now, uh, a lot of the, the letters that Paul writes, not all of them, but especially Galatians, Romans, and Ephesians, it has to do a lot of the time with how does Israel relate to the church? What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Jew? How do these things go together? Uh, and so they have to deal with this problem of legalism and works righteousness. So, be, because that's an emphasis in the context, if you fast forward about, whatever it is, 1,500 years, you could understand why Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians, which has this big emphasis on salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, becomes so important to Martin Luther. Because while it's not the exact same problem, right, the Judaizers are not exactly the same as medieval Roman Catholics, they are very similar. They've got a lot of the same problems. And so Luther especially uses Romans, Galatians, and Ephesians to demonstrate uh, the problem with works righteousness to show that salvation comes through faith in Christ alone and nothing else. So the, the contexts are a little different, but there's a very, there's a clear line of application between Paul and Luther in that respect. So Paul decides he's going to address the Judaizers, and he does rebuke the Galatian Christians because some of them have been taken in by the Judaizing heresy. Would somebody like to read for us? If you would, what I would ask of you is to read, uh, let's say, the first uh, six verses, please. Galatians 3, 1 through 6. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed 
the Lord in vain, says he who supplies the Spirit to you and the work and works miracles among you do so by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. All right, thank you, John. So if you ever hear the trope that you have to be gentle and kind with people all the time when you rebuke their errors, I suppose that's not true. Because he says you're foolish. <laughs> Who's bewitched you? He says some other really actually very R-rated things in the book of Galatians. Um, it is the Bible. He wrote it under the inspiration of the Spirit. So he basically says if you're really that concerned with cutting off certain parts of your flesh, maybe to make yourself extra righteous, you can cut off the whole thing, is basically what he says. Uh, that's what St. Paul says, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But, so foolish is kind of mild, I suppose. Sometimes I forget, John, that uh, you and I are basically the only guys in here, so I say things that are inappropriate. Uh, but, uh, oh well, you keep coming back. So anyway, he says, foolish Galatians. Uh, and I like how he, he, how he says it. It's before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, they did not in this period in the church. They did, and we had Ed too, I'm sorry. We've got three guys. Um, in this period in the church, they didn't have crucifixes or images or things like that. That comes a little later. But what he's saying is in their proclamation, it's like, it's like seeing Jesus portrayed. You know, you can listen to somebody who's a good speaker and they kind of paint a picture. So he's saying, you saw him crucified. So how could you believe if, if you know that Jesus Christ was crucified for your sin, how could you believe that you contribute something in terms of works of the law to your salvation? That's foolish. Uh, somebody's bewitched you to believe that. So he kind of drives home that point then. How do you receive the Spirit? Is it by works or by hearing with faith? You probably know that verse from Romans. Faith cometh by Hearing, not doing, not de deciding, not praying sinners' prayers and things like that, not asking Jesus into your heart. Faith comes by hearing. It's a passive thing because it's the work of God. Uh, faith believes. It, it receives. It accepts. That's what faith does. Doing a work is not believing. There's a difference. Uh, so you don't, you don't receive the Spirit by doing. You receive the Spirit by believing. Um, we're going to skip around just a little bit. Uh, he quotes in verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Remember, they see Abraham as their father. So something that Paul does, Jesus does this too in his little encounters with the Pharisees, is he, he all, they always appeal to Abraham. Abraham is always held up as a model of faith. He's our father. You know, he's our spiritual father. We do like Abraham does. We believe like Abraham believed. And so he quotes, um, because you see the quotation marks in 6. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. That's from Genesis, I believe it's 15. I think I put that on your sheet. Yeah, Genesis 15. That's when uh, Abraham has obeyed God. You know, he's left Ur of the Chaldeans. That's Genesis 12. He's journeying toward the land that God's going to give him. And Genesis 15 is where God takes him outside. Because he said, uh, I'm going to bless all the nations of the earth through your offspring. And remember, Abraham is kind of geriatric at this point. He says, I have no heir, and my heir is Eliezer of Damascus. And God says, let me show you something real quick. And uh, he takes him out, and he says, number the stars if you can, because this will be your descendants. And it, the scripture says Abraham believed God. He had faith in God's promise and it was counted to him as righteousness. That is to say he was justified. He was made righteous by his faith. So the writers of the New Testament, this is one of their favorite verses to, to quote because it shows, oh, well the same way that Abraham was made righteous, I am made righteous. And it's the fulfillment of that promise God made to Abraham. Because it's true. All the nations of the earth have been blessed in Abraham because now there are members of all nations who believe in Jesus as the Messiah. 
So he does that continually. We always hold up Abraham as this example. That's why we sing. That's why the kids sing. Out of the mouth of babes, Father Abraham had... Many sons. And many sons had... Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. But you're not Jewish. So that's all praise the Lord. Yeah, but, but see, so you see the point of the song that they teach to the children? You are a son of Abraham, Right? Because you believe in the God. You believe in the promise that, that Abraham, our father, believed in. It makes you an Israelite. So no, you don't have to wring your hands about Israel and Palestine. All right, let us continue. Verse 7. Uh, does anybody want to read 7 through 9? Did we have another spill? Oh, my uh, gosh. No, no, no. Okay. Okay, good. Well, nice not, save. Not that I would embarrass you or anything. but. None of the words were affected. Hey, there you go. I mean, just the end of, just the Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Miraculous. I just have to put it in front of the dryer That's right. The They'll be all right. It'll be fine. Yeah. All right, does somebody want to read 7 through 9 for us, please? Okay, this, I don't know if you could have a better passage for our purposes today. He says, know that it is those of faith who are, Dord has children, the word literally you can see in the ESV is sons. That's what makes you a son of Abraham. There you go. It's those who have faith, they're sons of Abraham. Because you know, one of the driving points of the New Testament is that the, the bloodline has served its purpose there's genealogy and stuff like this so Jesus can be born as a man. Now it doesn't matter, right? God has constituted a people from all nations, from all bloodlines, ethnicities, nations. Uh, those differences don't go away, by the way. They don't just disappear, but we are all one in Christ. So what does it matter if you're descended ethnically from Abraham, Ishmael or whoever else. See, those our genealogy is traced to God Himself through being incorporated into Him by grace through faith, holy baptism. It's interesting. You see in verse eight how the Scripture is personified. It's kind of a neat thing. It says the script, like the Scripture is a person, you know, because I mean it is God's word, right? The scripture foresees what's coming, you know, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And so the scripture, isn't that weird? The scripture preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, quote, in you shall all the nations be blessed. And that's the one from, that's from Genesis 12, yeah. So if you've ever heard that passage, I think I put it on here for you, didn't I? It's on here somewhere. Doesn't matter. That's the one, if you've ever heard it quoted, when, when God says to Abraham, I will bless those who bless you, I will curse those who curse you. Uh, and he says, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Well, in what sense? I mean, if, if God was confining his grace and his salvation to one little group of people, that doesn't really make any sense. But uh, remember, the reason he chose them is because he wants everybody to be a son of Abraham. He wants all people to be brought into Israel, into the church. So that's, uh, and, and the thing is, like, it doesn't make any sense otherwise. I mean, that's why, you know, that Jesus is the fulfillment of the scriptures. Because otherwise, you take the Jesus part of it out, and it's like, it doesn't make any sense, you know. Unless, unless you're going to be like a Jewish person, and then you can, you can make up different interpretations to kind of keep away from that. So, it's really terrible. We should pray for the Jewish people. All right. So, one thing we'll see, too, is uh, sometimes Paul or whoever in the New Testament will say, by faith, you're son of Abraham, sometimes son of God, sometimes son of Isaac, so on and so forth, because he's making the same point. It's all one people. It's a spiritual people. So we'll see that. 
You know this passage, Galatians 3. It's on page 5, by the way, if you want to see it. Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, if you belong to him, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. All right. Probably one of the most abused passages these days. As we mentioned last week, if you weren't here, I guess you're going to want to go listen. We talked about how equality is kind of made up. And uh, this is not a... Look at the kind... Remember, the question is, in what sense... So if you say there's no difference between Jew or Greek, there's no difference, he says there is no male and female. You have to ask the question, in what sense is that true? Is it true that because you're a Christian, you're not a male or a female? No, you are. If you're a Christian, are you still a Greek? If you're descended from Greek people, you're still a Greek. If you're a Jew, you're still a Jew. If you're a slave... You're still a slave. He says, there is no, these differences are effaced. They don't matter because you are one in Christ Jesus. As we talked about last time, we have a common salvation. That it doesn't matter your sex. It doesn't matter your socioeconomic status, whether you're slave or free. It doesn't matter if you're a male or female, man or woman, uh, Jew or Greek, Gentile, whatever. It doesn't matter in terms of your salvation. That's what the passage means. So you notice it doesn't say stuff that people want to make it to say. Does that passage say that women may be ordained? Well, there's no male and female. It's not about the order of the church, though. It's about salvation. Okay, you see what I'm saying? Does it mean you can be transgender because there's no male and female? Nope, it doesn't say that. It doesn't take away what got the created reality. What it says is people of all different kinds they are one in Jesus Christ. That's why your bloodline, for the terms of your salvation, does not matter. It might matter on Mari, but it doesn't matter, you know, your eternal standing before God. Or Jerry Springer, whichever one you like, you know. So, I've never seen any of them. Okay, but you see the point, you are Abraham's offspring. You're an Israelite. You're a son of Abraham. And we can go on and on. I'll let you look at the other ones in the interest of time. Let's, oh, I see it now. Well, that was nice to know. Okay, I'm going to read a little bit. Verse 10, back to Galatians. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. If you trust in your works for your salvation. For it is written. And this uh, Deuteronomy. Let's see. Where is the note? Deuteronomy 27. Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Right? If that's the standard. God demands perfect obedience. Well, guess what? You, you can't do it. So this is why legalism is such a dumb thing. Because eventually, you, even if you deceive yourself, you have to come to terms with the fact, I can't do it all. Right? I can't do it perfectly. I can't do it out of a pure heart. So the law then accuses us. That's what God says in Deuteronomy, even before Jesus comes. He says, cursed is anyone who, who doesn't abide by all these things. Verse 11, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. So no one means no one. That means Gentiles are not justified by the law. That means Jews are not justified by the law. There is no, like, that, that nonsense that we mentioned where, well, the Jews are saved by keeping the law and the Gentiles saved by faith. That's not true. That no one, everyone's a sinner. No one can be justified by the law. And then he, he proves what he's saying. For, quote, the righteous shall live by faith, which is the passage that Luther, when he read it, he said this was like, it was like a thunderbolt from heaven. It was like the kingdom of heaven was open to me. He finally got it. He's like, oh, righteousness comes through faith, not through doing things. It's a gift. Twelve, but the law is not of faith. And that's an important point. The law is not a bad thing. The law is from God. But the law is something different. The law is about doing. Faith is about receiving what's been done for us by Christ. 
But the law is not of faith. Rather, quote, the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because Jesus took our curse upon himself. For it is written, and this is an amazing little passage also from Deuteronomy, I believe. He says, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And see, Paul takes that from Deuteronomy and he applies that to what happens to Jesus, right? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? The answer to that is no. Every time I hear that hymn, I'm like, no, no, no. But it says, were you there when they hanged him on the tree? Right? That's what happened. Just like when I hear that song, Mary, did you know? I'm like, yes, yes, yes. She did, she did. I know, we've been going for a long time, sorry. And it's still a pretty song. It is. I do like it. I don't, I don't like the hate. I don't like the hate on it. I don't think it should be sung in church, but it's a nice song. And, and it does confess that her son is the great I am, which is a wonderful confession of Jesus' divinity. Um, I just don't think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, you know, but whatever. Um, yes, yes, yes. So, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Verse 14. So that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So there's that blessing that he mentioned. How are all the nations of the earth to be blessed in Abraham? Uh, it, it comes to us through Christ. Christ. Jesus is that point of contact. He is the way to receive the blessing made to Abraham. He is the way to become the son of Abraham, to become part of God's people and to receive that blessing through faith, he says. All right, five minutes, five minutes. Do you want to ask anything? you want to say anything? All right, we, have, we will, I hate to have to do it, but we'll have to stop kind of in the middle. Well, maybe not, let's see. It's kind of helpful because you, you're trying to follow the logic of Paul's argument. Paul is a very detailed, kind of complex thinker, and uh, he's weaving this argument as he's going. Uh, you'll notice, you can kind of see it in the English, Paul, he just writes like run-on sentence after run-on sentence after run-on sentence. It's really fun to translate in Greek. But he's like, it's just pouring out of his pen, so he's got to, you know, he's got to get it down. Let's do a little bit of this. Verse 15, to give a human example, brothers, even with the man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. So with a man-made covenant and agreement, when you make the agreement, man's as good as his word, word is bond, we shake on it or whatever. Cannot be changed. Okay, well, 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. All right, let's pause for a second here. Now, ESV has offspring. Does anybody have another word instead of offspring? I don't know if the NIV has something different. In verse... Um, seed. You have seed? Mm -hmm. Good. That's the word. It's my favorite word, is seed. Um, I wish English translations did this more consistently. Remember the, uh, the promise of the seed. Remember Adam and Eve screwed everything up? And the first preaching of the gospel happens right there in the Garden of Eden. And it comes in the form of a threat against the devil. Because God says, I will put enmity, put adversarial relations between your seed, devil, and her seed. She, or I'm going to mess it up. You will strike his heel, right? And he, one guy, the seed, will bruise his head. Right, crush his head. That's Genesis 3.15. That's the first preaching of the gospel. That's what we're looking at through the Old Testament. Who is the seed? When is he going to come? Uh, the word is seed. Offspring is a kind of... Offspring or descendants kind of a vague word. I mean, it has the same idea, but um, seed comes from the word where we get sperm. Sperm is a seed. Sperma is the Greek. Uh, that gives you better the idea of what we're talking about here. Interesting, too, women don't have seeds. 
But uh, in case you didn't know. Um, but God says it is the seed. He doesn't say the seed of the man. He says it's the seed of the woman. Because the seed is born, uh, I mean, eventually, you know, he's got grandparents and great-grandparents, and they're all, you know, swapping seed and stuff like that, the way it's supposed to be. But the seed is born of the woman. There is no man. The man didn't give his seed for that seed to be. It's a virgin birth right there in Genesis. Um, Anyway. But see what he says is, so seed would help this. I, you can still see it with offspring. The promise is made to Abraham and to his seed. Paul is making the point singular, not to his seeds. So Paul is taking what the Old Testament says, and he's saying it refers to one person. That's a very different way of reading the promises made to Abraham and to Israel. Paul also, and I forget where I put this on here. Oh, it's right there. Oh, lovely. Um, On page 7, Paul makes this point in 2 Corinthians. And this this sounds so simple, and yet when when you have your friends and neighbors who believe these false teachings that we've mentioned, you you can see how they, they don't consistently believe this. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians, for all the promises of God find their yes in him, in Jesus. That is why it is through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. The point is, everything finds their yes. Everything, the promises, everything in scripture finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the grand theme. He's the sum. He's the substance. He's the climax of everything in the Bible. So when you hear things like, well, there's still Bible prophecy about the promises God made to, you know, Israel. It's like, no, there's not. All those promises, St. Paul says, that those promises were made to Abraham and to his seed, to Jesus Christ. So it's fulfilled in Jesus. It's not fulfilled in any other way, you see. You have to let that one sink in. Uh, but, I mean, the, the, the simple way is all the Bible's about Jesus, okay? Um, it's all about Jesus, and there's other things. If it distracts you from that, that's not the consistent teaching of the Bible. Uh, I guess we will stop right there. Um, I guess we have to. But uh, that's kind of the point. So when all, all these promises are made, all these blessings, how, how, do, how do you and I receive them? Receive them through Jesus Christ. There's not something else beyond that. It's not like promises for Gentiles who believe in Jesus, promises for Jews. There's nothing like that. It's everything finds its yes and its fulfillment in Jesus. Okay, Uh, do you have any closing thoughts, questions, reflections, observations, rebuttals, or anything else? Yes, let's do that. Bring this one back. I won't kill more. I'll kill trees for other purposes. How about that? So I hope to see you tonight. Dinner, 530. uh, Vespers at 630. Uh, Let's close with prayer. Gracious Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that uh, though we were at one time uh, strangers and aliens uh, from your commonwealth of Israel, that you have drawn us into your people, the Holy Christian Church. Uh, We pray that always we would cling Uh, to Jesus, your Son, who was foretold by the prophets, uh, who was proclaimed to us by the apostles and those preachers that you have sent to us. We ask uh, that as we uh, strive with you, as we wrestle with your word the way that your servant Jacob uh, wrestled with you at the river Jabbok, we ask that you would give us clarity by your Holy Spirit, uh, that we would read and mark, learn, and inwardly digest all of these wonderful things that you would reveal to us. We pray uh, that in all things you would strengthen our faith in Jesus, our Savior and Messiah, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you so much.